Welcome to Varsity Chemistry. I'm Eric, and I'm going to help you review for the AP test. I'll start with the basics. So hopefully you know by now that chemistry is all about atoms, and each of these get their unique identity, or their element, through protons. Protons have a positive charge, and the number of them contained in an atom is given by its atomic number. Neutrons are another part of atoms, and they don't have a charge, so they affect atoms by creating isotopes, or slightly different forms of the same element. The final part of an atom is the electron, and it's the most important part of chemistry. They have a negative charge to balance out the protons positive, and the electrons in their positions around an atom can be expressed in this electron configuration form. On the AP test, you'll probably be asked to use this to determine the element it corresponds to. This configuration can also be expressed through photoelectron spectroscopy. Not only does it show the different ionization energies of different subshells, which will come up at least once on the exam, but it also demonstrates the principles of the most important law of chemistry, and that's Coulomb's law. Most things in chemistry can be vaguely related to this law, but it comes up on the exam in two main forms. The first can be found in its statement that a greater charge difference in most cases between protons and electrons leads to a greater attraction between charges, which can be used to describe why certain atoms are larger or smaller than others, even if their electrons are in the same subshells. The other way it comes up on the AP exam is that it states that a greater distance between charges leads to a weaker attraction, and it can be used when you're asked to explain why electrons of higher energy levels are easier to remove than electrons of lower levels, which are closer to the positive nucleus. Next, there are bonds, which are super important in chemistry, and a lot of the exam will have to do with them. These bonds are formed as a result of electron attractions between atoms and molecules, which has a lot to do with electronegativity, or an atom's affinity for electrons. Anytime you think of electronegativity, you should also think of Fonkelbrush, which lists the most electronegative elements in decreasing order. Large differences in electronegativity within a molecule can lead to an imbalance of charge, or a dipole, which causes intermolecular forces to form, an incredibly important concept to know about for the exam. Dipoles can be permanently formed in this way, or temporarily formed by the slight movement of electron clouds. This concept is known as polarizability, and it's a buzzword that will come up on any explanation about nonpolar molecules and their states of matter. Really, any question about states of matter as well as solubility should send your mind straight to IMFs. There are three main types of these IMFs you'll be asked about on the exam, so I'll list them out in order of increasing strength. The first is London dispersion forces, or LDFs, which every molecule experiences, and they are the weakest. But College Board likes to introduce nuance with this on the exam, because they can be stronger than other types if there's a large enough molecule or a larger electron cloud, leading to greater polarizability that strengthens this force. Stronger, there are dipole-dipole forces that require a polar molecule to be experienced. Finally, there are hydrogen bonds, which are quite strong, requiring one polar molecule and a hydrogen atom bonded to a fawn on the other molecule. Generally, any question about water or solubility will have something to do with them, and knowing this will be super useful in FRQ explanations. There's also ion-dipole interactions, but those are harder to find on the exam, and they're only talked about as an explanation for why salts dissolve in water. Another thing to do with bonds is hybridization, which plays a small but significant role in every AP test. When bonds are formed inside of molecules, hybridization occurs in the electron subshells. It's a decently complicated concept, but all you need to know is that each bond or lone pair attached to an atom is a domain. This number of domains is then expressed in the form of an S and however many P's are needed to add up to this number. So that's SP, SP2, and SP3 for the most part. Moving on, it's important to know that there are three different types of reactions in AP chemistry, and they all have different lines of questioning that go with them. The first is a precipitation reaction, in which two aqueous solutions become a different aqueous solution and a solid. It's super easy to identify, and you'll be asked about equilibrium on these types of equations. Next is redox, which is pretty significant on the test and can be identified by a change in oxidation number. These can be assigned by going into each molecule 
and assigning each atom a number that corresponds to its favorite ion, or zero if it's alone, adding up to its overall charge. If the oxidation number decreases, the element is reduced as it gains electrons to become more negative. If it increases, it is oxidized as it loses electrons to become more positive. Oil rig is a good mnemonic to remember it. Finally, there's acid-base reactions, which have a lot of factors that'll go into later, but they can be identified by checking for bronsted lori conjugate pairs as an acid donates a proton to a base, with each becoming conjugates of the other type of molecule. How these reactions work are explained by kinetics, a pretty unassuming but kind of complicated concept, and it describes the relationship between reactants and products. These relationships can be expressed as zero order, in which the rate of production is unaffected by the reactant concentration, first order, where production is proportional to reactant concentration, and second order, where production is more or less the square of reactant concentration. You'll definitely be asked to interpret graphs to determine order, and this is a good example. First of all, it uses absorbance as a measure of concentration, which is proven to be proportional by Beer's law. How this concentration is expressed can then be used to determine the order. If normal concentration causes a straight line, it's zero order. If the natural log of concentration creates a straight line, it's first order. And if one over the concentration makes a straight line, it's second order. With that, you can see that the reaction here is first order. Another important part of kinetics is knowing how to increase reaction rate which can be done through increasing concentrations of aqueous solutions, increasing the surface area of a solid, increasing pressures of gases, increasing temperature to make collisions more often and of higher energy, or adding a catalyst to let the reaction take place without needing as much energy. This is definitely glossing over the equation part of chemistry, but if you apply this base knowledge and your formula sheet to it, you'll be good. Another thing to do with reactions is equilibrium, and it's reached when the rate of the forward and reverse reactions are the same. Going into the math, which equilibrium is almost entirely based on, the ratio of the products to reactants in equilibrium is expressed as K. To calculate it, you place the products over the reactants using concentration to calculate Kc if it's aqueous, and partial pressure for Kp if it's gas. Q is another expression of this ratio, but it is when the reaction is not at equilibrium. It can be used as a gauge for what the reaction will do to return to equilibrium after a disturbance that makes Q not equal K. This is supported by Le Chatelier's principle, which states that reactions will change favorability in order to make Q equal K again after a disturbance. You'll use this key term on FRQs to explain why favorability change happens. At least a few questions of the exam will have to be answered through the process of determining equilibrium concentrations, which can be done with an ice table. The best way to set it up is to put the reaction over the table, put the initial concentrations in the top row, follow the stoichiometry of the reaction to show what changes with plus or minus x in the change row, and then add the two terms together to express the equilibrium concentration in the final row. Finally, you can plug these values into the K equation with the provided K value to solve whatever the question is asking for. In the context of the test, anything to do with molar solubility or equivalence pH will be using this process. Acid-base chemistry is the next concept I'm going to cover, and it's the extension of equilibrium only with a little bit more math. Going over some basic equations you'll have to know. The pH of a solution is the negative log of the hydronium or hydrogen ion concentration. From the pH, you can also work backwards and find this concentration by putting 10 to the power of negative pH. When bases enter the mix, it's also important to know that the pH plus the pOH is almost always equal to 14. A final important math thing to know is that the pH of a solution at the half equivalence point, which I'll explain in a second, is equal to the pKa the negative log of the acid's equilibrium K value. Moving on to the conceptual part of acid-base chem, here's the titration curve. It's a staple of the AP exam, and you can see the initial pH here, the final pH here, the equivalence point here, and then the half equivalence point at half of the milliliters added as the full equivalence point. 
You'll see this graph essentially in this form everywhere, maybe being upside down if a base is titrated with an acid. The zone around the half equivalence point is pretty important, as it can also be called the buffer zone, a point of pH stability. The pH is kept stable here through a weak acid or weak base equilibrium that neutralizes added hydrogen atoms or hydroxide ions to an extent. When you're asked to determine buffer pH or the ratio of conjugate base to weak acid, you'll use the henderson hasselbach equation. Okay, almost done. Now we're talking about thermochemistry. To get things straight, delta H is enthalpy, or heat change. If the reaction is endothermic, or absorbs heat from the surroundings, it'll be positive. If it's exothermic, or releases heat into the surroundings, it'll be negative. Negative enthalpy is almost always thermodynamically favorable. Now, delta S is the entropy, or the ordering, of the reaction. A positive delta S reaction is disordering where more molecules or looser states of matter are in the products. A negative reaction is ordering, in which things solidify or become simpler. Positive entropy is almost always favorable as well. Now, delta G is Gibbs free energy, which sounds complicated, but all you need to know is that if it's negative, the reaction is favorable, and if it's positive, it's unfavorable. The relationship between all of these variables can be seen through the Goose Hunters Take Shotguns equation right here. You'll use this most for explaining why reactions are favorable under certain conditions in FRQs. Another thermo equation is the Q equals MCAT equation, which shows the relationship between energy absorbed or released, the mass of a substance, its specific heat, and its temperature change. You just plug given variables into it to find what is missing or asked for. The final important aspect of thermochemistry is the graph of reactions, which you might have to draw or interpret on the exam. So I'll give some examples. This is exothermic. This is endothermic. This is the activation energy. This is the activation energy with a catalyst. And this is the activation energy when another pathway is used. At long last, there's electrochem, which is basically the harnessing of redox reactions to make electricity. It works through separated redox reactions using the transfer of electrons that occurs to make energy. The most common setup you'll see with electrochem is the galvanic cell, or a thermodynamically favorable battery. It looks like this. At the anode, the loss of electrons and mass occurs through oxidation. At the cathode, the gain of electrons and mass occurs through reduction. You can remember these because oxidation and anodes start with vowels, and reduction and cathodes start with consonants. With batteries, you'll definitely have to find the overall voltage. So to do it, you'll flip whatever voltage from what's provided that will make the addition of both positive. The one you flip is the anode. When the E value is positive, the reaction is favorable. If it's negative, it's unfavorable. This is proved by this equation, which you'll use to explain why this is on FRQs. Anything else in electrochem is on your formula sheet, and you'll just have to look for it if it's asked. Now that you know everything, I'm sure you'll get a five on this exam. Just remember, when in doubt, convert to moles. When in doubt, make an ice table. When in doubt, let the units be your guide. When in doubt, use that formula sheet. And always remember, that you have this amazing superpower to shrink down to the size of atoms and molecules and visualize everything that the test throws at you. Good luck. You'll do great. Okay, that's it. Okay, good job. Wow, that's a lot.